Hi, welcome to the Ascension Parish Library in Donaldsonville. Today we have a very special program. Our program is entitled Recollections of Donaldsonville. My name is Dion and our special guest is Mr. Vincent Cy Tortorich. He has lived a very interesting life in Donaldsonville and we're going to talk about his life today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Cy, thank you for coming today. We welcome you to the library. Um, I'm just going to ask you some questions and feel free to answer in any way you want. Um, first of all, where were you born? I was born in the great city of New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I always tell people I, I'm from there. Uh, there's something in, I guess I drank the water early, and I love New Orleans. Uh, I visited there so often. Uh, my, I have, uh, my dad was one of 11 children of immigrant parents from uh, Busakina, Sicily. And of course, they were raised on a farm in McCall, at McCall, Louisiana, which is oh, between Donaldsonville and White Castle. Yes. And uh, it had a post office, and it was McCall, Louisiana. That's where mail and everything else went there. And, uh, but it was Evan Hall Plantation. Wow. But uh, the reason I, my mother told me that, uh, uh, that I was born in New Orleans was because uh, I don't know how many months or weeks or what else, but uh, I, was, uh, I was a preemie. Yes, yes. And <clears throat> it, it was, it, preemies at that time, <laughs> I guess, didn't make it unless they were in a, a, a hospital like Charity Hospital in New Orleans yes. that uh, had incubators and, and, and things of that sort, and it was more modernized than the little uh, doctor's offices here in Donaldsonville and the surrounding areas where doctors were actually in a house and yes. treated their patients and they, they uh, made house calls yes. and, and things like that. But uh, mom told me the story. Uh, she uh, said she'll never forget being in the ambulance uh, going to uh, New Orleans on uh, 61 uh, that uh, when, when she passed uh, through Laplace, yes. she could smell the oil <laughs> from the oil industry and all. Yes. But uh, those are just some things she told me. Uh, how long I stayed in New Orleans in an incubator or whatever, I never didn't know. Uh, was it a week, two, three weeks, a month? I, I really didn't know, but I was born in charity, and my dad told me yes. that he uh, put me in a shoebox wow. uh, when I came to Donaldsonville. Wow. So I came to Donaldsonville in a shoebox. Wow. <laughs> and uh, wow. I don't know, they never did. Uh, maybe two, two and a half pounds. Wow. Uh, I don't know if it was wow. less than that, uh, but 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 that's kind of story of being in New Orleans, and and uh, of course I went there a lot also because my dad had three siblings yes. that left the farm uh -huh. and moved to New Orleans, and we would go and visit a lot, and they would come here to Donaldsonville and visit a lot. We used to tease them uh, when they came with their cars, their cars were flat and they would collect all of the vegetables and everything that was raised here on a Sunday. Wow. <laughs> and the car was sitting down like that in the back <laughs> going back to New Orleans. Yes. But uh, one of my dad's brothers worked uh, for Huff Truck Line in New Orleans that later was bought out by Cy, uh, that, that, that operating today. And uh, he, he was Tony, and uh, he lived on uh, 1500 block of Magazine Street. Yes, Magazine Street. 
And my first cousin, uh, Sarah, uh, still lives at the same house wow. uh, uh, on Magazine Street. They had two homes, wow. and my uncle married a Corona. That was the last name, uh, Italian lady. And they had a grocery store right next door at the 1500 block of Magazine Street. And we used to go there a lot. And, and right across from there is uh, Annunciation and yes. Felicity. Yes, Annunciation. My grandmother grew, grew up on Annunciation. Well, yeah, well, my aunt married uh, a decorated World War II Marine. Wow. My uncle Morris, and that Italian name was Ambrosia. Yes, yes. And yes. the Ambrosias had a grocery store right there on Felicity and, and Annunciation, wow. where I think they later built the Fisher Housing Park Project. And uh, I remember the Yellow Cab Company was like to the back of that store. So wow. I went to New Orleans a lot. And of course, uh, you know, you had to visit the Audubon Zoo yes. and, and yes. things like that. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I love New Orleans and, uh, and, and that's, that's exactly, you know, where I, was, where I come from. Right. <laughs> Until right. I came to Donaldsonville. Um, tell, me, tell me about your, your parents and your wife's parents. Uh, where, oh. where were they from? Yes, okay. My grandparent were, my great grandparents were from Busakina, Sicily. Uh, they, their last name was uh, 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 Giuseppe Solario. And my grandparent, my, uh, uh, they had one child they came to America with, and uh, her name was uh, Serafina who would have been my grandmother. Yes. And uh, they uh, lived on the Mississippi River uh, north of, uh, of uh, Evan Hall, McCall, on the river itself. That was the main road to New Orleans. Wow. Uh, on the west side of the river. Mm -hmm. They lived right at the parish line, mm -hmm. Ascension and Iberville. And today it's called Chatham Plantation. Wow. And uh, uh, my grandmother came here as an only child with her parents from, uh, from Sicily. My grandfather was from the same village. Wow. And uh, they knew each other and all and, and contacted each other by mail. Uh -huh. And in some cases, uh, sent money, uh, you know, over there, uh, and grandfather uh, came, I'm thinking about four or five years later, wow. and went to Evan Hall, McCall, Louisiana, and uh, he, he, he and my grandmother married in Smokeman's Church, wow. right here, uh, just north of Donaldsonville, yes. Yes. and all of their children were baptized in Smokeman Church. Wow. So we have a lot of, uh, Maria and I did some research one time. We went there and all of the records are there and wow. so on and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> so that was the grandfather's Tortorich. We don't know how the H got on our name. Wow. It was, it was, it was uh, pronounced Tortorici, wow. Italian pronunciation. An itch got somewhere. Uh, I have my grandfather's passports. Oh my God. We are uh, original from Italy. Wow. He came on a ship to California. Wow. And he embarked from Palermo in Sicily. And uh, my, my great grandparents had come through the port of New York. Now, how they got here, I never could find out. But my grandfather came through the port of New Orleans. Yes. And it said that uh, from my uncles, I understood that uh, they uh, told them that where the different plantations were on the river and where they were going to work, 
My grandfather was a shepherd, I guess, in, in Sicily that wow. took care of sheep wow. and goats and all of that. Wow. And uh, a lot of the Italians uh, from New Orleans walked up the Mississippi River to the plantations they had to, uh, that, that, that where they were going. Wow. And of course, my grandmother was here and she was on Chatham and it took them five or six days to walk <laughs> the yes. river yes, that's from well New gone. Orleans. Yes. And uh, I hear that they slept on a levee at night and, wow. and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, that was sort of uh, my, the Tortorich side. <clears throat> the other side, well, I always, also wanted to say my Uncle Tony was in New Orleans. My Aunt Pauline, who was an Ambrosia. Uh, you might have heard of her, her son, Chef Buster Ambrosia, uh -huh, uh -huh. who cooked at the, for the Brennans. Oh, wow. And all that. They live on the North Shore now. Wow. The other brother that was there was Sordo. Uh -huh. And uh, 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 he, he was on the uh, west side of the river. And uh, his children uh, live on Stump Boulevard in those places. Now, sad to say, my Uncle Sardo, one of his sons, my first cousin, passed away yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah. he, uh, he was Eddie Tortorich, and uh, uh, yeah. he worked for the sheriff, and he worked at McDermott and things like that. But anyway. McDermott. Yes, McDermott. Yes, I've heard of McDermott. Yeah, McDermott. They McDermott. up in New Orleans. Right. So those were the three siblings that were in that area. Tony, my Uncle Tony, my Uncle Sardo and, and uh, my Aunt Pauline, who was Ambrosia. And uh, all of their children, my first cousins, are there now. Wow. And uh, we have contact with them uh, uh, often. Uh, uh, oftentimes we might visit. Uh, we're up in age now and we don't visit as much as we used to. Yes. But, uh, yes. you know, the other side of my family, my mother, her name was Catherine, uh -huh. uh, and she was a Pizzolatto. Wow. And that's a big name around here, wow. the Pizzolattos. Uh, her mother was from uh, St. Rose on the river, and uh, her mother was a Cascio. Wow. So we're looking at Italians from Italy or Sicily wow. that were all Italian. Wow. There was no mixture. And I gotta mention this, Marie, my wife. Yes, yes. The family name was Tripodi. Yes. And her dad was a Giardina. Wow. And when we were married, I married Marie Teresa Giardina. Wow. And uh, we, uh, the union there were all Italian blood, if you want to yes. say it like that. So pure Italian. Pure, pure Italian from Italy or Sicily. Wow. Her people were mostly fishermen, uh -huh. oyster fishermen and all, uh -huh. but wow. they were from a part of Italy called Reggio, Reggio Calabria. Wow. And that is where the toe end of Italy it looked like it's kicking uh, Sicily, <laughs> and wow. the straits there, the straits of Messina. Uh -huh. So uh, that's where her family was from, and uh, uh, the, the grandfather, Papa Tripodi, we called him. Yes. Uh, they lived together with uh, uh, her mom and dad in the same house. They had a big house, it's right a couple of blocks from here on uh, uh, St. Patrick Street. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, they had uh, children, uh, 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 her aunts, uh, uh, and, and her uncle Cam, and, and uh, so they, they, were, they were right here in Donaldsonville. And so uh, that, that was the line. And we always say, Marie and I had four sons, and that would have been third generation that were all Italian, all Italian. <laughs> blood. Wow, all Italian blood. <laughs> it, yes. 
it's mixed now. Yes. <laughs> Our yes. grandchildren uh, have some Spanish in them, the Roussels uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> from uh, 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 Lutcher, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. you know, and uh, and and one one of the grandchildren is is is, is got a lot of German. Uh, German. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, the the line is is breaking, but uh, anyway. To answer your question, uh, uh, hopefully I answered it correctly. Yes. If you have anything else you want me to add, uh, yes. and they were all farmers here. All farmers, yes, yes. Uh, sugar cane farmers. Uh, later on, sugar cane. Uh -huh. My grandfather, when he came here, his job on Evan Hall, my grandfather, uh, uh, Tortorich, uh -huh. was a uh, horseler. That was the term that his job was, and I'll tell you why. The most important thing on a plantation was horses and mules wow. that had to be cared for because there were no tractors. Wow. And they uh, worked the land. Uh, he, he had over I understand, uh, more than 150 horses and mules. He had other people working under him. He made 50 cents a day. Wow. And my grandmother made money by selling eggs uh -huh, uh -huh. and vegetables and stuff like that, as an egg was 50 cents a dozen. And uh, she uh, evidently, and the word they use in Italian is schifiata. Uh -huh. I know a lot of uh, Italian uh, uh, words, they're all the bad ones. That that what that one wasn't a bad one though. Yeah. That meant that they saved their money. Yes, yes. And in six or seven or eight years, maybe ten years, how they accumulated at that time three, four, or five thousand dollars wow. that they claimed they saved under the mattress. Wow. Uh, wow. You know, they would send money to uh, Italy. Uh, into Sicily, and uh, I understand they would they would sew it in in the in the cuff of a shirt, wow. and they would write in Italian, and nobody would understand what they were writing about. Wow. Like money, I think was called scongi. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and uh, uh, they uh, supported their their family back in. Uh, it, now, they, they, they left because things were real, real bad yes. in uh, Sicily and in Italy. And, uh, uh, you know, it was dictator and, uh, yes. and stuff like that. Yes. And that's why they left for a better life in America. In America, yes. And that's why you see sometimes in the, in the late 1800s, uh, all of the people getting off the ship yes. in, at, at, the, at uh, uh, Ellis Island. Uh -huh. And coming to New York, and why there's so many Italians in New York, and and then they spread all over the country. But that's what grandfather did. While I'm on that, the property we have on Bayou Lafourche, uh -huh. right just south of Donaldsonville, here about a half a mile. Uh -huh. uh, during the Depression, the bank wow. seized two plantations that couldn't pay their bills. Wow. It was St. Elizabeth, uh -huh. right where the railroad track is, over the track going down by Lafourche, and the other one was Nolan. Uh -huh. uh, for the bank to get their money back, and there were two sugar houses on those plantations, wow. just like the one at Evan Hall at McCall, Louisiana, uh -huh. was a sugar house. And, uh, the, the way that they got their money was they divided all of that land of those two plantations fronting on Bayer Lafourche, uh -huh. the water's edge, they called it, uh -huh. and surveyed it all the way back, uh, like maybe 20 acres, uh, 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 two miles, it's uh -huh. two miles. And it was strips of land that was that far from by Lafourche going back to uh, uh, two miles close to the Assumption Parish line. Yes, yes. 
and uh, uh, they uh, put those strips up 110 foot wide uh, for farming uh, up for sale. Wow. How in the world? Well, I know how because they saved their money. Wow, that's amazing. From the railroad track going down by the Fouche, yes, all the way down to uh, where uh, there was a dairy farm, Reno's. And uh, there's a street there and dairy farm. Mr. Reno had a big dairy farm. There was another dairy farm, Dupairs, uh -huh. that was uh, uh, down the river here where, where the plant is now, CF Industries. Oh, okay. That's and uh, uh, wow. they delivered milk to the house. Wow. And you know, you had the bread man yes. that yes. delivered the bread, <laughs> they delivered yes. the milk, they delivered, uh, you know, whatever. People like that at that yes. time did that. And uh, you had the vegetable man wow. that would go around with vegetables and, and they would wow. buy vegetables. Kind of like they're delivering today now, but a little, a, yeah. a little different. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, 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 that, that, that's what happened at that time. And, and my grandparents, you know, uh, were able to have enough money, wow. which $3,500 at that time, yes. you were rich. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And they could buy the property from the bank. Wow. wow. And it just so happened that they were all Italians. Wow. Wow. Starting from the thing, the, the Marcellas, the Sotils, wow. the, uh, 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 the Tortoriches, wow. the, the Fontanas. Wow. Uh, you go on and on and on, the Latinos. They, those are the people that bought those strips of land uh -huh, uh -huh. on the bayou. Wow. wow. And uh, uh, they had the money. They had so they, they worked hard and they saved their money, and that's how they bought that property up. We still own two tracks wow. Wow. Uh, uh, of that property uh, just south of, uh, I'm sure you see, you come into town, you see the railroad track. When you go down, I don't know if you've ever been down by Lafourche, but you turn. But uh, uh, we live about a half a mile. We live one mile exactly uh -huh. from the Mississippi River. And later on, we talk about the Civil War. Yes. I'll tell you about the battle, battles that was fought there and so on and so forth. Wow. So is there anything else you would like to know about Italians coming here? <laughs> well, let's see. I have another question for you. I know that um, you have uh, four sons. Four, right. And I also know you've worked a lot, a lot of different jobs. Did you want to talk about your, your jobs or your, that you've worked? I, I know you've worked a lot. Of, and you have two master's degrees also. <clears throat> well, yes, from LSU. Uh -huh. And uh, one in library science. Yes. And uh, one in uh, administration and supervision. And uh, 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 so uh, we also, Marie and I, both went to Nichols. Wow. And uh, that's where we got the library degrees. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, so, so uh, we went to Nichols because I did, because we'll talk about this later on, about me spending so much time in New Orleans and playing music and blah, 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 <laughs> that I got on cut probation. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes. wasn't attending classes and stuff like that at LSU in my third, and uh, maybe in my junior year, sophomore, junior year. And I, I was also a member of the LSU Fighting Tigers Band wow. for three years, and uh, which helped a lot because it was a scholarship, wow. even with food wow. and uh, 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 registration and everything else. Now, what, what instruments do you play, Todd? I play two instruments. Uh, if you look out this window here, uh -huh. I was raised in that building. Wow, wow. That was the Ford uh, 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 building. Uh -huh. Right here where we're sitting right now yes. was Club Bar. Wow. Uh, and it was a, a building that was run by the mayor of Donaldsonville, uh, Lala Regera. And uh, we were very close friends. Right at the corner 
was a, another ballroom called the Bel Air. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, it was Pops Fontana. And down the street uh, by Lemons was the, the Welcome Bar. And it was the, the sheriff, uh, former sheriff's dad, uh, Harold Tritico, uh -huh. that, uh, uh, you know, had that. But we'll go in, into that more maybe later on. Now, what was the question again? You've, you had uh, many different jobs. Tell us about some of the jobs you've had. <clears throat> At 10 years old, maybe nine, there was a, uh, my dad's friend. They used to work and build things on the weekends and stuff like that. Wow. People would help each other. Yes, yes. Even building houses. Wow. They would come. Uh, and uh, my dad's friend was, uh, I'll never forget him, Mr. Eddie, Edwin Rodrigue. Uh -huh. uh, and for some reason, south of Thibodeau, Louisiana, is a little community of what called Chack Bay. And uh, some of the people that eventually came, they were mostly French, Rodrigues and Lejeunes and stuff like that. Uh -huh. And they came to Donaldsonville and, 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 and married like into our family. Wow. Oh. Uh, and Eddie was one that married my Aunt Rita's, uh, 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 Pizzolata's brother. Uh, and, and, and they lived down the bayou where we live, we call it down a body. Right, right. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they, uh, Eddie, after World War II, you know, things were, I remembered, I remembered the war. Yes. I was like uh, maybe three years old, three and a half wow. years old, and I remembered the blackouts. Wow. You couldn't have lights at night on. There was an inspector that came around to check because the German planes, if they flew, and they were close to Homer in the Gulf, wow. would, would, would bomb the cities if they saw the lights on. Wow. And there was what they call the blackouts. And at three, three and a half, I remember the inspector coming around to see if there was any lights on in the house. Now, the little house we lived in <laughs> was a little two-story cypress standing up plank house uh -huh. with no electricity yes. and uh, with lamps uh -huh. on by the foods where we lived. And uh, 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 so they came, and I do remember collecting iron yes. and stuff like that and selling for the war effort. Wow. Corky used to buy uh, the iron and give us 25 cents or something like that for any old bicycles or something like that for the war effort. So I do remember World War II, and I think I was in the first or second grade when it ended. Wow, wow. That was in uh, 44, 45. Wow. And uh, Marie tells me she's uh, a little younger than I am, but she remembers the... Uh, she remembers the uh, end of the war. Wow. Tell us about your music. We lived off of you playing music. Okay, yeah, yes. Yeah, tell us about your music. Okay. Eddie, that's what I'm getting to. Mr. Eddie uh -huh. worked for Mr. Ewing, uh -huh. the Ford dealer, who had an army surplus store in the next block by the bank. Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> Eddie... The new cars came out in 49, I'll never forget. And uh, Mr. Eddie bought a 49 Ford for Mr. Ewing because he, he worked for him at the Army store. Uh -huh. And he used to pick me up. He and his wife, Miss Velma, had no children. Uh -huh. And they would take me as their child. Wow. We would take a ride to Chack Bay, to Thibodeau, we stop get a hot dog or, or whatever. And uh, I became real close to Mr. Eddie uh -huh. because he was he and my daddy were real close. Yes. Uh, and what, my dad's name was Mike, uh -huh. Michael. So uh, he would pay me 
50 cents, 75 cents, sometimes a dollar. Uh, we would take these rides on Sundays, but I would, on Saturdays, I would go to the Army store uh-huh. and straighten things out on the shelf and yes. sweep the aisles. I was nine or 10 years old. Wow, wow, so I worked and, young. And he would give me, man, a dollar was a lot of money. Yes, yes. So uh, Mr. Ewan would come there and check on his Army store. And uh, he would tell, he, he asked that he'd say, who's the kid? And he'd say, oh, he, he, he's my, uh, my uh, good friend's son, and his name was Vincent. Well, Mr. Ewan knew the name Vincent from Vince Lombardi and uh-huh. football, and he was a football player because he was recruited by LSU wow. from Nebraska, wow. and he was a fullback in 1923, 24, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he tells me, he says, look, if you want a little, another little job, he said to come to the Ford place, he said, and uh, dust the cars off in the showroom, and I'm, I'm pointing over there because it's right there. It's right there, yes. And, uh, uh, and keep the floors clean and stuff like that. Oh, yes, Mr. Ewing. You come every day after school, and uh, by that time I was riding my bike, bicycle. Yes. And I, I, I could, instead of catching the bus, I could come here from right there at the school and ride my bicycle home in the afternoon. Uh-huh. And uh, he gave me uh, $3 a week yes. to work uh, all day Saturday uh-huh. and to, uh, 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 to uh, wait about an hour every day after school. Wow, wow. So I got to know this man and like him. He was a strict, stern businessman. Yes. Some people didn't care for him a little bit. They didn't know how he sold cars. Yes. But uh, he, sold, he sold cars and trucks. Yes. Uh, Fry Brothers had uh, uh, Frankfurters and all that. They had a plant here. They would buy their trucks from him, and Cokie, right across the street, yes. would buy their trucks from him. Uh, he, he was a businessman. He was also became, he was a sugarcane farmer, wow. and, and he raised uh, potatoes. Wow. He was enterprising. Yes. He got to be older. I got to be like 14, 13, 14 years old. I could drive real well. Yes. But no license. Wow. Mr. Ewan's eyes go bad on him. I think he lost one. Uh-huh. And I was his eyes. Wow. I drove him everywhere. Wow. He used to go to Natchez, Mississippi to Butra's Wholesale and buy Army surplus to bring to his store. At that time, people bought that stuff like big time. Wow. I remember Marie had what they call a, a navy pea coat. They were big blue coats. And uh, uh, they sold maybe for like a dollar and a half or two dollars a piece wow. from the navy. A lot of that stuff was new. They had army stuff, army store. People used to buy their pants, their boots, their everything. Now, that army store was really hopping. And where the bank is right here, yes. the next store was Day of Block. Uh, they were Jewish people, and uh, Mr. Gaston Hirsch, whose uh, son went to school with Marie, Dr. Hirsch, uh-huh. you might know him, he, he, he's still a medical doctor, he's in yes. Gonzales. Yes. But anyway, uh, right next door to that, where that empty lot is right now, uh-huh. was the Army store. Wow. Right next that, to that, was Wiles Department Store. Uh-huh. It was a nice store. Wow. And Henry's Barbershop, and, and then the big building that you know they repair now, Lemon. Yes. Well, she, Marie, worked there. Uh-huh. She was Mr. Falcon's secretary. Uh-huh. She was uh, maybe uh, 14 or 15 years old. 16. 
16, <laughs> and uh, wife of Mr. Falcon, who ran uh, one of the departments. Lemons was the Walmart of Donaldsonville today. Wow. wow. It had everything. Wow. Anything you wanted to buy, you could buy there. A horse saddle, mule saddles, whatever, on and on and on and on. Wow. So that was kind of my life around here. Mr. Ewing was so happy that I went to LSU. He supported me and told me on Saturdays, you come and work in here and give Miss Etta your time or anything. Thanksgiving holidays, I went, yes. Christmas holidays. Wow. I stayed with Mr. Ewing maybe into the 70s. Earning money there. That's good. Now, you know, uh, you asked me about my music. Yes. And what do you want to know about music? Well, uh, <laughs> didn't you, uh, did, aren't you on an album, uh, the picture over there? Uh, okay, the music is a story in itself. Uh-huh. Did you play with Pete Fountain or some of the I played with Pete. Musicians? I sat in with Pete here in Donaldsonville. He used to come to the town and country club. That was, uh, La La Regera had something to do with it, the one that had the club ball, but it was Ralph Falsetta and uh, his cousin Tony Falsetta. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> when Fats started playing rhythm and blues, came out in 54, uh -huh. I'm going down to the river, going to jump overboard and drown, stuff like that, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, 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 the song, well, we young people kind of fell into that music. It was rhythm and blues. Yes. Now, right down the street, <clears throat> the store is still there, Bellinas. Yes. Bellinas. Must be 100 yes. years old. Yes. The, the, the school would let us off an hour every day, <clears throat> uh -huh. and we would go and get our bologna sandwiches there yes. and walk back uh -huh. and get our potato chips or whatever. Yes. That, that was our meal. There was no lunchroom or anything like that. Yes. And my uncle came from World War II, and I think he wanted to live through me because he had always wanted to play an instrument. Yes. Frank was his name. Wow. He served in... Uh, in the Pacific, on Guam, Okinawa, wow. New Zealand, Australia. Uh, he came back a sick man. He had malaria and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Well, there was another uh, uh, veteran, uh, the DeLeo family, uh -huh. that lived right down, right across from where Belize is. Yes. Well, they, they were what we called back of town at one time. Back of town was behind the tracks. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And they had a, a Italian settled back there like I don't know what. Uh -huh, uh -huh. In fact, that's where Maria's grandparents were and all that. And the uh -huh. Delios were there. So my uncle comes and, uh, and uh, tells me one day, uh, I want you to play the clarinet, uh, you know, and uh, I know you could take lessons at a dollar an hour, a dollar for one hour. Mr. Carl DeLeo, who's, uh, he had the best band in the state of Louisiana, marching band in Gonzales, uh -huh. Gonzales High School, lived here, and he, taught me private lessons. Mr. Tubby would let me go from uh, uh, one hour. Wow. Leave there on a Saturday morning and go walk down the street and take my clarinet lessons. Wow. And I got to be pretty doing good on clarinet. This man was wow. a genius, a wow. teacher, Mr. Carl DeLeo. Wow. And uh, he had played at LSU before he went to the service and all that kind of stuff. And he taught me how to read music like you would never know. Wow, and that's like another language, huh? Oh, is it? It's a universal language. If you play music, you play in Russia, 
<laughs> you see the same notes and whatever uh -huh. that you see in America or Sweden or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, I got to be doing good wow. at uh, 10, 11, 12 years old playing the clarinet. Wow. And he was the one, I think, that got me the scholarships later on when I went to LSU. Yes. Because he called the, uh, 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 the major man, the head of the uh, music school, and said, I, you got a kid up there that could really read music. Uh, Mr. L. Bruce Jones. Wow. And that was a concert band. And only music students at LSU was in the concert band. They had the marching band and the concert band. And he called me one day. And I, Mr. I mean, what in the heck Mr. Jones want to talk, speak to me for? Yes. He says, son, what are you doing uh, in education? Yes. I said, well, that, that's, that's what I'm going into. He said, I can give you scholarship in the music school. Wow. He said, in fact, I need a baritone saxophone player uh -huh. in the concert band right now. And that's the same fingering as the clarinet. Wow, I didn't know that. He said, would you mind taking a test? I said, yes, sir, I'll take a test. So he put a, some music in the front of me and I played it on an alto saxophone, which is the same key. And uh, he says, he says, uh, I'm ordering a new Selma. That's one of the best saxophones ever made, and they were called Indiana. Wow. Gold played it at that time, one thousand dollars. It was a one thousand wow. dollar horn. <laughs> wow. So uh, he said, I want you in the concert band. And then he tried and tried and tried to get me in the music school, but I, I didn't do it. I, I played in the concert band, and I played in the Tiger Marching Band. Wow. Uh, three years. We went on trips at that time. Buses would take us to Houston when uh, LSU played Rice. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we'd go to Kentucky, wow. uh, Memphis, you know, and that. Well, anyway, <clears throat> here comes this rhythm and blues music out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Yes. There was a guy there with a studio, and they still have a, a his, I think his son or grandson still has a store on Royal Street. Yes, Royal Street. His name is Cosimo Matassa. And I asked him if he was kidding him Matassas and Donaldson for some reason he didn't want to claim them. <laughs> but he wasn't related to him. He looked like a Matassa. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he uh, started uh, uh, cutting records for the, 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 uh, the 45s uh -huh. the, with uh -huh. the round hole. Yes. Fat Domino, Dead Bartholomew. Marsalis, uh -huh. Dr. John. Yes. I knew all those people wow. because I'd go to Cosmo's studio uh -huh. on Governor Nichols Street uh -huh. Uh -huh. in the quarter. Yes. So uh, uh, Fats would come to the town and country club here almost every Saturday. Uh -huh. He would go to the College Inn in Thibodeau. And at that time, we formed our own rhythm and blues band bunch uh -huh. of kids, yes. I, I call us kids at that time. Yes. Jerry O'Quinn, uh -huh. Keith Vetter, who is a, a very good friend of mine. He's a lawyer and he taught law at Loyola. Wow. And he still lives in New Orleans. Wow. He was from Donaldsonville. His wow. dad was uh, the mayor of Donaldsonville, wow. Vetter, wow. Uh, myself. But the, the horn to have then in rhythm and blues was not a baritone sax, and it wasn't an alto. It was a tenor. Wow. Man, and I saved up enough money, and I bought me a, a tenor bushel. Uh -huh. I had three clarinets. And I still got all that at home. Wow. All that, and I play it yet every yes. now and then. Yes. Fats got to know us. Wow. Uh, Irma Thomas. 
Yeah, but here are. Yeah. <laughs> all the new, all the musicians all yes. came. Little Richard. Yes. They yes. all came through Cosmos Studio, wow. Imperial Records. Wow. With Dave Bartholomew and all those people and Dr. John and and, and all that. And uh, then my uncle sometimes would take me to the uh, Roosevelt Hotel. Yes. On Saturday night. And Pete Fountain would be there wow. because Pete used to play in Donaldsonville here. Wow. And Al Hurt wow. came to yes. Donaldsonville. And we used to sit in with them. Wow. So I went to New Orleans and I remember Mr. Nyash Jimbroni. Jim Jimbroni is up from Donaldsonville. Uh -huh. He came to, and we went to uh, the Roosevelt to the Blue Room. Yes. That was a big thing in the 50s uh -huh. and 60s. WWL was 50,000 watt clear channel yes. after 6 o'clock at night. Wow. And you could hear WWL all over the country wow. and in some foreign <laughs> yes. countries. Yes. So the, uh, i never forget the announcer was a man named Pinky Vanakovich. Yes. Uh huh, uh huh. And he was the announcer for WWL, that you know is still going strong. Yes, yes. So uh, he called me up to sit in with Pete. And I was a young, young boy then. And boy, they made over it and everything. This kid is 11, 12 years old, whatever. And he's being heard on WWL, yes. uh, 50,000 watts. Wow. And then another Saturday we went, and Al Hurt was playing in the Blue Room of the Roosevelt Hotel. Wow. And he knew me and invited me to play with Al Hurt. Wow. <laughs> so those are the kind of things that happen. And, and I started uh, Cosmo needed extra instruments in the band sometime uh -huh. to back up Fats. Now he had an excellent tenor player from graduate of Xavier University. Uh -huh. And his name was Lee Allen. Yes. And anybody that played sax wanted to play like Lee. Wow. The rock and roll. My radio music teacher <laughs> was uh -huh. DeLeo did not like the type of music we were playing. Uh -huh. He used to tell us, yeah, I'll play that <laughs> crap. <laughs> you know, but that, w that is what was coming in. Yes. So our little smaller bands that we had, we'd play in the town and country club. We played the college in Thibodeau. We played on cars in Chagby, Mike's in Chagby. We go as far as wrestling. Uh, we played in New Roads. Wow. Well, we would play in all the dance halls around here and got to be pretty darn popular. Wow. Tell and her let me tell you. How much y'all made? Huh? Tell her how much y'all made. At that time, we made 10, 12, sometimes 15 hours a night a piece. That was a lot of money. Yes. When we got married, we lived off of that money. Wow, wow. I paid for the house I'm living in wow. with music money. Wow, that's amazing. That's well, amazing. that's when I copped out of LSU in my junior year. Yes. I was living in New Orleans, sleeping in my car. Yes. On Governor Nickel Street. Uh -huh. I caught the Asian flu. I had to come home, and I was in the bed for six weeks. I mean, it was bad. Wow. I got on cut probation and everything else. And uh, I was gonna have to wait a semester out. My dad never went to school a day in his life. He was the water boy on the plantation. Mm -hmm. The water boy had a little donkey with a cart uh -huh. that pulled the cart through the fields and they had 10 cups hanging on the side on a hook. Uh -huh. 
This is a field cup. Wow. People kept them in their pocket. You see how it folds? Yes, yes, yes. But once you pull this up, there's no drip, there's no nothing. Wow. This is rare. Wow. And this is what they used on the plantations. And uh, 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 these, these kind of cups. My dad was the water boy. At that time, grass would grow in the, the, the cane that was coming up in the spring. Uh-huh. It would hamper the growth of the cane. Wow. They didn't fertilize too much back then. And what they would do would, uh, uh, you had maybe 100 people in the field with a hoe. You know what a hoe is? Yes. Hoeing grass around the cane plants. And my dad, from 10 years old, drove the water cart with the donkey to the fields so the workers could have water to drink. Wow, wow. Uncle Joe, one of the oldest, Never went to school, worked on the plantation. My Aunt Jean, she married a Latina. She never went to school. My daddy had a sister named Louise that I understand died very young. Uh, The next one that came along was uh, uh, my Uncle Tony that was in New Orleans. Uh He had a little education. But somebody said my grandmother started teaching some kids at the house how to read and write. Wow. Okay, so my Uncle Sordo, very, very little. That was the one that lived in New Orleans. Uh, My uh, Aunt Grace, who was never married, uh, she and Uncle Joe, who was never married, lived in the house uh, of my grandfather. That, that's the, the property that we, we got now. Yes. And it was said that anybody, uh, whichever one died first, the family could not put them out. Yes, yes. Well, yes. That, that, that was that. It was simple as that. No papers, no nothing. Wow. They, they just agreed they to that. They honored to that. They honored yeah. that agreement. Uh-huh. So, uh, 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 Uncle Joe and Aunt, uh, Aunt Grace died, and Uncle Joe lived, and believe it, he became very, very close to our oldest son, Mike, that's got the, the, the property now. Yes, yes. So Uncle Joe believed in Mike. He wanted to leave everything to me, and Marie said, no, Uncle Joe. We don't need that. We got everything we want. We don't have to have 50 acres of sugar cane. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. The land is leased now to, to other farms. But anyway, I don't know if she did it or what happened. But uh, we told Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe, we have four sons. We know you favor Mike. He said, yes. Uh, Marie or somebody suggested, and she never did tell me, that the property be left to our four sons. Wow. So he did that. But he favored Mike. He wanted him to have on a main road on Uh 308. Uh And that's where he is now. He's got his business. He's got a big shop. He's he's a a hell of a mechanic. Wow. He could fix anything. He's the only, he didn't go to college. He went to trade school when he graduated. We were very upset. I couldn't take it. (laughs) Uh I said, Marie, you and I are college graduates. Yes. And Mike got to go to college. Yes. So we went to look for him at at a career night at where Nichols, LSU, and Southeast and all that. Uh He wasn't in none of those meetings. I said, Marie, where's Mike? Yes. Somebody said, go check at the trade school (laughs) meeting. That's where he was. 
Right, right. And you know, sometimes you can do very well working with Did a trade he? more than, yes. than going to college. You talk about successful. Yes. Uh, he finished, he started welding. He's a welder. Wow. <clears throat> and mechanics. One of the biggest dealerships in uh, Ascension Paris, Dago Pontiac Buick. Mm -hmm. And it's right across, you pass there on 30 and uh, yes. uh, what is it now? It's another, where, where the GMC trucks and all are sold, it right there on 30 and 22. Burnside? Huh? Burnside? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where Dago was. Uh -huh. And uh, he was a colonel in the National Guard, uh -huh. O.G. Dago. And his brother was the captain on the George Prince. That, that was the ramp right here that crossed the Mississippi River before the Sunshine Bridge. Wow. Well, to say the least, Michael was, uh, uh, you know, uh, Uncle Joe agreed. And she called the other three boys, I believe. She never did tell me. Uh -huh. Mark. Vinny and Charles. And they all said, we don't want nothing. You give it, you give it to Mike. So Mike, in turn, gave each one of his brothers an equal share wow. of all the property. That's amazing. No lawyer. <laughs> that's how it is today. And that's how our family was. So, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, um, uh, and let me mention, we got, we got some great daughter-in-laws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, and I got to mention them, Brenda. Yes. Brenda is Michael's uh, wife. Uh-huh. And uh, Christy uh -huh. is Mark's wife. Serena, we told you, they live in Virginia now. Yes. And, uh, 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 and, uh, <laughs> Kelly. 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 <laughs> I always forget Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly lives in Prairieville. Yes. With Charles. That's Charles' wife. Yes. And, and they gave us, we got four grandsons. Four grandsons. M Michael had two. Uh -huh. Very successful. Yes. Both college graduates. Yes. Uh, and Mark has two. One of them, his, Hayden, one of his children, moved a week ago to Tucson, Arizona. He wow. got a big job wow. for Riathon. And, uh, and the other one, one granddaughter. Well, so I want to ask you something. You, you actually played a role in, in getting Ascension Parish Library. Oh, God. Okay, we You did a lot for this area. Tell me about your role in getting this library here. All right, we can get on that now. I'll be acting up about the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and now, uh, when we finished Nichols in 61 or 62, but anyway, 61. there was a, uh, they were trying to establish a library school at Nichols. Most of Nichols' teachers came from Northwestern. Mr. Monty Cheeves, uh, uh, all, all, uh, 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 Dr. Joe Gray Taylor, he was from Tennessee, he was my history teacher. But here comes this lady from Northwestern, and her name is Miss Agnes Clark. And she established and tried to get people in her library program. It was kind of hard. So, that's when I had left LSU because of being on, on, on that uh, probation thing with the flu and all that stuff. I went home and told my daddy I was going to work for a semester. And he pulled his belt off and was going to really put me a licking. Yeah. No, you going to college. And yeah, remember, this is a man that never went to school day in his life. Yes. And my mama had a fourth grade education. Yes. I said, Daddy, I can't. I said, all of them schools have registered. 
Well, the postmaster here was Mr. Ernest Garnell. Uh -huh. We knew him real well. Uh -huh. His brother-in-law, who had one leg, was the registrar at Nichols. And his name was Mr. Powell. Uh -huh. So uh, I was telling Mr. Garnell one day, uh, man, about he said, look, what? I said, it's too late to register. He said, look, go see my brother-in-law, Mr. Powell. He's the registrar. So I go there. Now, Mr. Powell, he says, son, why are you so late coming in the register? Well, she was there. And uh, I said, uh, I kind of lied to him a little bit. <laughs> I said, uh, I'm, on, I'm on cut probation for it. Well, that, that was the truth. From LSU, I said, and I, I want to go back to LSU. Well, at that time, Nichols was a junior college, uh -huh. and they wanted to get students yes. in there. So uh, he said, son, how was your grades? I said, it was all right, Mr. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I had an A in band. <laughs> uh, I took golf. I had an A in golf. Uh -huh. I wouldn't tell him that I feel mad. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, maybe had a, a C minus or something in English. Yes. No computer, no nothing. He couldn't. He said, son, if I register you, he said, it's going. He said, I got to get your grades from LSU. I said, yes, sir. But at that time, it took about two or three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> he registered me, Mr. Powell. And uh, he said, I'm going to keep track of you myself. Well, he put, put me in Dr. Joe Gray Taylor's uh, history class, and boy, I love the Civil War. I love history. And I, uh, man, I was coming out of there with A's and B's on my test. That's awesome. And uh, I had good English grades. To get a minor, I had to have a minor. She was with Miss Clark in library science. Yes. So Miss Clark wanted people too. So she said, uh, isn't your boyfriend here? I said, yeah. And I said, Marie, man, a man being a librarian? I said, man, that, that's sissy. <laughs> so she convinced me to, to uh, you know, get Miss Clark's class. Miss Clark was a wonderful lady. She was never married. And, and all that kind. But anyway, I get a call. Dr. Taylor. Mr. Tortorich? Yes, sir. Uh, I got a note here. You see Mr. Powell at the class. I said, oh. <laughs> so I go knock on the door. Come in there. Mr. Powell, how you doing, Mr. Tortorich? And he was looking at some papers. He said, uh, I see you're doing well in history. You're doing this. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Boy, I was feeling good. He said, I want to ask you a point blank question. I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, did you lie to me to get into this, uni uh, into this uh, college? I said, Mr. Paul, I told you the biggest lie that ever going. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I told you the biggest lie you go ever hear. <laughs> Boy, he shook his head. He said, you know, <laughs> you're making good grades now, he said, but man, <laughs> he put his hands in the air. I said, I'm out of here. He said, no, you're not out of here. That's good. He said, uh, <laughs> you're going to keep on. That's good. He said, because you were honest. You told me you lied. <laughs> <laughs> so stayed there with her, Miss Clark. Man, we had the Caldecott books. I had the Newberry. I can go on and on. I know you know about all of that. Yeah. Man, we had to, I knew them all like that at that time. 
and the uh, Newberry Award and stuff. And she, you know, but anyway, uh, thing got good and uh, she wanted to finish school because she wanted to get married. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> no. But anyway, she, uh, she finished and she was taking 21, 22 hours. Making A's and I don't wow. know if she made any B's. Wow. But anyway, she finished in three and a half years. Wow. And I finished and we both had degrees in library science. That's amazing. Miss Clark, the passenger trains used to pass here in Donaldsonville uh -huh. from New Orleans going to Shreveport. Uh -huh. Miss Clark lived in Natchitoches. Uh -huh. She couldn't drive a car, she couldn't do anything. So she depended on us. We would pick her up at Nichols, wow. bring her to Donaldsonville, wow. put her on a train. She would come back. She would call us. I'm back in Donaldsonville. We'd pick her up, bring her to Thibodeau. Sometimes she'd sleep at our house, at my mama's house. Wow. So uh, uh, that's the story of that. Now, <clears throat> I finish. Here comes LSU wanting to start uh, a library program in Ascension Parish. They call them what? Test libraries? What was the word? It was, it was to test to see if it would work. Tell it. And, and Ascension Parish was one of the first parishes oh. that they were going to try this library in from LSU. It was going to be an extension of LSU. Wow. So, they sell a library down here. She was from New Roads. Uh -huh. Miss Vivian Kezio. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've ever seen her name mentioned. And another librarian came from LSU to help her get started, and, uh -huh. and she was Miss Adams. Uh -huh. But anyway, they wanted to get certified librarians. Well, here comes this young girl, my age, from around, from St. Landry Parish, a place there on Highway 90, close to Opelousas, called Port Barry. Uh -huh. Her name was Jess Lynn Booksy, B-E-A-U-X-I-S. So they wanted to uh, <coughs> get started. And what they did, the little building is still on Railroad Avenue. Uh -huh. There was the Grand Theater there. Uh -huh. And right across was uh, Joe Babin's uh, donut shop. Uh -huh. And I went to school with Kermit Babin, his son. But uh, the building was empty. It wasn't a donut shop anymore. It was now a library. A library, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they hear that. I got a degree in library science. Yes. So they called me in and wanted me to work for the library. Tell them how much you made. Huh? Tell them how much you made. I think it was $190 a month. Yes. 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 Because teaching paid $220. <laughs> That's yes. what I went to later. Yes. later. And, uh, but look, I was, li I was, I was doing, living on music. Yes. And waiting for this man across the street, yes. who are now giving me 30, 35 hours a week. Wow. Wow. And sometimes he would say, Vince, let's go to New Orleans. Hey, Mr. Ewing, we're going, we going to eat, we're going to drink coffee and beignet. Yes. At the, yes. The, uh, the, Cafe Du Bois. We're getting a brand new Ford car, 57, whatever, man. We go to uh, New Orleans. Anytime he wanted to go somewhere because he had blind in one eye and couldn't see out the other one too good. Yes. I was his eyes. Uh -huh. And uh, he would let me have these brand new cars that came out, 57, 56, and all that Crown Victoria, to go anywhere I wanted to go. Wow. Wow. His brother was down there, was a shop foreman. He came from Nebraska too. Uh -huh. And a cousin, J.T. Davis. 
And uh, I remember him telling Tubby, they, had, they were having an argument, him and his brother. It was about me. Wow. And uh, Paul, who was a shop owner, had a, his brother had an old car. He said, that kid's going to ruin you. You letting him have new cars and all this kind of go what he want and, and <laughs> this and that and that. And he would, he would give me a used car uh -huh. to go home with. <laughs> <laughs> or go play music. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, one time he let me have a brand new car to go to Alexandria. Wow. And play wow. music. And, and uh, I got caught for speeding. And uh, he was there. And Tubby said, I heard him say, you just don't worry about that kid. <laughs> He's mine. But Tubby couldn't see. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a little bit about, you know, well, I want to ask you another question, Cy. Um, where, where have you and your wife traveled to? I know y'all been all over. So where have y'all been? <laughs> y'all live such an interesting life that, we you know. Been to every major city in this country. Wow. We have been to every state in the lower 48. Wow. Canada and New Mexico. Uh, I went into something that started costing money <laughs> and had to wind up going to the bank and I put in quite a bit of debt, uh -huh. maybe, maybe sixty-five or seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> uh -huh. This, I said the country was going to be my playground. Uh -huh. I find out in a, in a national magazine about this great American race that will start from one ocean and go to the next. Wow. And I said, man, I want to do that. You had to do it in antique cars. And it was a time distant race. They would have four cameras somewhere within two or three hundred miles. Wow. And they would know what time we had to get at those cameras. But they would tell us how fast to go, how slow to go. Uh -huh. Or if you hit a train and had to wait, you had to figure your time out. Yes. If you were driving 30 miles an hour, you might have to drive 45 now uh -huh. for 15 after the train passed. Wow. It was that type of race. Wow. So you had to plan, do a lot of planning as you went along. Do what now? You had to do a lot of planning as you went along. Oh, they, they had instructions, but it was... Only you would know how to read the instructions. Uh -huh. It wasn't written instructions. It was signal sign instructions. Like at this curve sign, you slow down to 25. Universal sign language. For three minutes. Wow. And then speed up to 40. Uh -huh. And it, it was a, it, it, it was really a something. It was so challenging to me. I did it in a Model A Ford. Uh, I remember I used to bring an extra motor, <laughs> all the parts, starter, generator, everything you could do in my trailer. I pulled the car in a trailer with all the parts behind my truck. Or oh, we had a van. Yeah. Well, we would uh, do that one night. Uh, I. My motor burned up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> Never forget. And there was a bridge going over the river. And I needed a block and tackle with a rope. Took everything loose on the motor to pick the motor up and all that. To put my new motor in that I had in a trailer. That was one of the things. Well, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. I said, Marie, we are hungry. Me and my buddy I had with I said, there's a McDonald's down there going. So she went, she stayed a while to get her some hamburgers. Well, she got bugged. <laughs> she took her purse, I understand, and, and beat him up. <laughs> and she brought, she brought the hamburgers. And uh, we worked all night long.
And at 5 o'clock in the morning, had that motor running. Wow. Out and in and running. And I did the rest. Because if you didn't start in the morning again, you got a DNF, did not finish. Wow. It was five or $6,000 at that time to, to join. Plus it cost another 5000 or more for hotel, motel rooms, gas for my, all, all that stuff, maybe ten, twelve thousand dollars a year, and then it still started going up. Where sometimes it would be twenty thousand, wow. and I get ready to go, and I didn't have the money. Yes. So I go to the bank and borrow it, yes. <laughs> yes. and say so I'm gonna pay it back. Well, that was a stipend you could win if if if, if you hit the the clock. Uh -huh. One race, we won five thousand wow. dollars. That was easy. I come back and I pay the bank. <laughs> Yes. But anyway, it got to be where I wasn't keeping track of it no more, but she was. Yes. And uh, we did this for 12 or 15 years. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she drove the truck and trailer while I was in the old car going across the country. Yes. And uh, uh, she, she followed, you know, and would be at the next town at night where, where we were going to stop and have a park for me, which is a big car show. Wow. And then go get a bite to eat and go to sleep and do the same thing the next morning. Wow. And it, it was grueling. It was grueling. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> we went with a good buddy of ours from Fort Smith, Arkansas. And sometimes I, I didn't drive my own car. I, I was his pit crew. Yes. He was a car dealer. He had a lot of cars, a truck, brand new truck. He'd give us anything, go across the country. Uh, Cy, he had that old Arkansas drag. You go ahead and load my car up and take it to uh, Portland, Oregon, where we're going to start. Wow. And me and Miss Sue, his wife, we're going to fly <laughs> there and, and do the race, and then I'll follow him. So we finished the race, no, Portland, uh, uh, Maine, okay. and we went to uh, Oregon. Oregon. Wow. So he got in the car, he won the race. He said, you know what, Miss Marie? <laughs> he said, we gonna smell the roses going back. He said, oh, side gonna go, we gonna go straight down this highway one from uh, Oregon. <laughs> Washington State, California, and we're going to uh, Yosemite National Park. Wow. wow. And then we're going to go across the, well, anyway, we're still on the road about six weeks with wow. old Dave. Dave, Dave really liked it. When we got to Arkansas, he would want to fly me back. Man, take a brand new truck down on my lot. Go to Louisiana and have fun and all that. I said, when are you going to get your truck? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of guy he was. Dave Reader was his name. But anyway, we did that. Well, Dave had a car collection of about, what, 50 cars? 40, 50 cars. And in his basement, he had this special, here it is, 1936. Ford that was raggedy as could be, had to be rebuilt. Wow. But it had a V8 engine in that car, yes. and I had never driven a V8. Wow. And uh, I had asked him for the car several times, and he said, man, it's not for sale. I'm going to restore it. And <laughs> so coming back, and I didn't know, he told Miss Marie, Miss Marie, I know old Cy wants that car. <laughs> but don't tell him nothing. I'm going to sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got home, that car was not looking like that. My son Mike and I restored it. Wow. Motor, transmission, everything, wow. painted, put a new top on it. He sold that car. That car was worth maybe about 
and the ship there was in about $30,000. Wow. Oh, my God. It is very, very rare. Wow. During the wow. Depression in 1936, people couldn't buy a loaf of bread or soup. And that cost sold for like $1,500 from Ford. Wow. So he said, Miss Marie, I'll tell you, if you want that car, I'll sell it to you. And uh, she told me all this after, I didn't know. He said, I'll give it to you for $15,000. She said, Mr. Reed, I want it. Wow. So when we got back home, she tells me, I bought that 36 Ford. I said, what? <laughs> Do it. She said, uh, uh. and I had a flatbed wrecker, the kind you see now picking up cars. Well, I went all over the country for 15 years with Price LeBlanc. Yes. Hauling cars to Jackson, Dallas, Houston, uh, whatever. She was still teaching school. Wow. So I had Dave's truck here. I said, well, that's good. We're going to load the truck on a wrecker. Go to Fort Smith, Arkansas, bring him his truck back, and we're going to get that car. Yeah. Put it on a wrecker and come back. <laughs> But anyway, that's what we did. We did a lot of traveling together and doing things like that with trailers or records or whatever, you name it, and came back with that car. And I had six months to get it ready for the next race. And where do you think it, it started? Where'd you go? Ottawa, Canada. Oh, my God. And it was going to Mexico, City, Mexico, wow. the great North American race. Wow. My son Mike and I got on that car, and you see it like it is now. That's awesome. I trailed that car to Ottawa and drove it 7,200 miles wow. oh to Mexico City, Mexico. Gosh. <laughs> you have to have the wheel. He thinks it's fun. Do not I lost one hubcap. That is not a fun thing to do. <laughs> it, it, it's it's work. work. It's hard. It's difficult. It's work. You've it's got work. to love it. You've got to love it to do it. And, and that's what I did. And it got to, uh, uh, the year my mom died, we were coming from Canada, and we were having trouble with the car. I was fixing it every night. Hardly have I eaten of it get it ready for the next morning. This particular day, the car ran beautifully. And we stopped the night in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh -huh. I told Marie, I said, Marie, we're going to get the biggest steak that I could eat. I said, because all we got to do is change the oil in the car. It's got water and everything to leave tomorrow morning again. They brought my steak, I was about to cut into it, and the phone rang. She, they wouldn't tell me. I think mom had died. Yes. But uh, she said, uh, Si, your mom is in the hospital in Baton Rouge. They had to take her with the helicopter and all that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. I, asked Brenda, I said, Brenda. Brenda called me Michael's wife. I said, why is she? She said, Mr. Si, she's unresponsive. You know what you were telling me. I didn't even eat that steak. I called the airport, and the only flight I could get to get back to Louisiana in a hurry was from Nashville to Pensacola, Florida, or Miami. <laughs> well, anyway, and then get on another flight and fly to Baton Rouge. But anyway, we flew all night. Wow. Uh, and I got to the hospital at about late at, late at about 9 o'clock that morning. One of my children, Charles, come pick, pick us up at the Baton Rouge Airport. Man, I held Mama's hand. You know, she was gone. Mm -hmm. I said, but she's breathing. But they had her on a machine. Right. You know. right. 
So a couple of days later, or a day later, Charles and all the boys came and said, Daddy, my mom is not with us anymore. Yeah. And I agreed to it. You know, the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life was tell them to pull the plug. Yes, yes. So at that time, I had a driver named Adam. He lived in uh, Jackson, Tennessee. Uh -huh. He drove my truck and trailer across, you know, following me. And what he did, so I wouldn't lose my money and all that that I put up. He drove the car, and one of Dave Reader's crewmen, he had a, two or three people, drove my truck and trailer wow. and followed him, stayed on three days. Then he flew in from California. And uh, I said, I wonder where my car is, because they had been racing with it for three days. Yes. Saw your car is at the border in uh, El Paso, Texas. Wow. And uh, the Mexicans were giving us a lot of trouble crossing the border with all these cars. There were a hundred of us. Wow. They wanted us to buy Mexican insurance. Yes. They, we all had our insurance, but they said it wasn't going to cover us in Mexico. But that was just a scam. Yeah. You know. So we stayed there three days, and I was on the sofa, and Vinny came to me at the house. He said, Daddy, here. I said, what's that, Vinny? He said, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow. He said, my ticket is going to Los Angeles. He said, but the plane's going to land in Dallas. He said, that's your ticket. I said, why? Man, man, what's going on? He said, Daddy, you can't bring my mom back. You know, we had buried my mama and all that, the funeral and all. He said, uh, you're going to go to New Orleans with me tomorrow, and we're going to fly to Dallas. Well, I said, well, man, how am I going to get to El Paso? Well, El Paso didn't have an airport. Wow. It was a dirt, little dirt runway. He said, we got you a plane. <laughs> wow. uh, uh, so, man, we got to Dallas. <laughs> he went on. They put me on a little rinky-dink plane with two motors. <laughs> and only me and the pilot was in there. Wow. Wow. And he flew me to uh, El Paso. Wow. Landed on a, on a dirt runway. Wow. And that's where I caught up with my car. But they wouldn't let anybody, you had to be the owner of the car to cross the border. Wow. So I had to be there or my race was going to end right there. Wow. I bought the Mexican insurance and all that and drove my car across the border to Mexico City, Mexico. Wow. 7,200 miles. Wow. <laughs> Well, this, this has been really interesting, Cy, talking to you about your life and everything you've done and your family. You've lived a very interesting life, um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of different things you've done and, and you know, the great American race and your, your college degrees and your playing music and the, just everything you've done is very incredible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been a pleasure talking with you and um, I just want to thank you so much for coming today to talk with us at the library mm -hmm. about your interesting life and everything you've done and about Donaldsonville. Mm -hmm. Well, and the only thing I think we got off on a little bit was when I went to work for the library, there were two bookmobiles. Yes. And I drove the blue one and Mr. McDonald Robinson drove the red one. And we would cross that ferry right here every day. And we had stops. I think you're kind of doing something like that now again, right? Right, yeah, yeah, Bookmobile now, yes. Uh -huh. And we, we had stops in Darrow, uh, Santa mm -hmm. uh Two Roads Grocery way back on the lake, and the different places that we stopped. And let me tell you, 
the people really used it. Wow. And then we went ahead and uh, passed a bond issue for this library. Wow. And I was president of the police jury then. Wow. And, and uh, we uh, uh, passed it. Uh, uh, I'm proud to say my name is on this library, the one across the river, and I think the one in Galvez. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, that's we, paid, amazing. Bonded, we did the same thing for the hospitals in that's Ascension amazing. Parish. So, great getting into politics, did a lot in, in these bond issues. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you've done so many different things, it's amazing. Uh, it, it went to New York and signed these so the plants could come that's on the river. I want to finish with this. Yes. Yeah. What this is. Okay. A used Coke bottle or Mark bottle was yes. very important to Italians. Yes. They did every three things with this bottle. My grandfather had acres and acres, and my uncle Joe of tomatoes. When the tomatoes would get overripe at the end of the season, they would make my grandmother would make their gravies for the winter, for their spaghetti and meatball and yes. They raised their own uh, uh, animals and everything, cow, milk, chicken. I worked on the farm. I, I, I did all of that for them and fed them uh, sugar cane and whatever. Uh, one thing this bottle was used for was put water in it and sprinkle clothes. And, and iron the clothes with the, with the hot iron. Wow. And boy, to dress up at that time, they wanted starch and iron clothes. Wow. You had to be stiff as can be, yes. collars and everything. The other thing they did with this bottle, my grandfather made this. Uh-huh. This goes through here and it sticks up a little bit. And they would scald the bottles and put their tomato gravy in there. Wow. They would take a, a rough top and uh, a brand new one to seal it with a cork and put it in here. They would put it on the bottle oh my gosh. Wow. and tap the, uh, the rough top on to seal it and they would have their gravies wow. and everything for the winter time. Wow. My grandfather made that. One other thing he made, Italians drank a lot of wine, made their own spigots. Wow. This went in the wine barrel. There's a hole going all the way through and coming out right here. This is hollow and there's a hole right here. So when they wanted wine, they would open it like that. Wow. And then they turn the little opening away, they would close it like that. Wow. These wooden things. And of course I showed you this. And uh, you know. Uh, and don't, and aren't you on the, uh, you got it. Oh, I can tell you about this. <clears throat> A lot of musicians in New Orleans and all, came out of Donaldsonville. One famous one was Claiborne Williams. Uh -huh. He was a black band leader, and he was born on by Lafourche at Bell Alliance. Uh, my teacher, Carl DeLeo, uh -huh. took music from him, and they called him the maestro. He had one song that was very popular in the United States and the world, called Logical Point. Uh -huh. Donaldsonville by City Hall has a, a jazz plaza. Wow. And musicians in Donaldsonville to be inducted into it is presented a brick. Wow. And all of the musicians from Donaldsonville are on bricks in the jazz plaza. Maybe you may want to go take pictures of that. I have to go look know. at that, so that's amazing. I see you have a brick. Huh? 
Exactly. Yeah, and I got a brick, and, and I'm proud of the brick. And, and that was, you know, that was about it, and showed you a few little things. I did one record that my name is on, 45. Went to Richard Brothers in Pierport, Louisiana. And uh, that guy is a big musician right now, Don Rich. Mm -hmm. he, he, that's his family. I played with him 10 years at the uh, Rainbow Inn and uh, wrote the song. We cut this in New Orleans at, at Cosmo Matassa's studio. That's amazing. So, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, I've yacked enough. <laughs> Uh -huh. You've lived a very interesting life. Um, I feel like my life is boring compared, compared to what you've been. You, you've lived such a great life. And, um, well, I, when I was sick in 2015, I had something, I don't know, stomach problems or whatever. Mm -hmm. I got a notebook, a spiral notebook, and started writing about all this yes. and maybe even more. Wow. Uh, I've got that at home. My grandson, Michael, is a, 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 a journalist. Yes. Maybe one day he might want to pick this up and write, and write about his grandfather. Yes. I don't know, yes. but I do have this and I have a lot written down. And now you've done this, you know, and yes. uh, whatever. You, you're a great man. You've lived a great life. Uh -huh. Your wife is also a great lady and she's lived a great life. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for coming today and telling the story. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, and I was glad and happy to do this, yes. and we'll do it any time. Thank you very much for joining us today for this special presentation entitled Recollections of Donaldson Bill. Mr. Cy Tortorich and Ms. Marie Tortorich are very wonderful people, and we thank them so much for coming today to do this presentation. We hope you have enjoyed it. Please join us again for another presentation at Ascension Parish Library's YouTube channel. Thank you so much.